Let's pray. Oh God, you are great, vast, immense, immeasurable. You hold the universe in the palm of your hands. The heavens and the highest of heavens cannot contain you. And yet you have condescended to be interested and concerned with people like us. Interested and concerned as a father down to the very details of our lives. Intimately acquainted with us. You care for us. We consider this morning the realities that you would choose to be a father to us. These things are staggering, too good to be true. I feel acutely my own inability and adequacy to communicate these lofty truths. We pray for your assistance this morning by your Holy Spirit through your word to grant us who know you an overwhelming, all-surpassing assurance that you are our God, you are our Father, you love us. Oh Lord, we cling to these things and we thank you for the truths that we we're about to dive into. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 8. We're continuing Paul's discussion here of what it means to live in the Spirit, life lived in the Holy Spirit of God. And we come across this morning the great and glorious, really indescribable doctrine of adoption. Do you remember junior high school? I remember it well. I somehow knew who the cool people were. Maybe you remember who the hip people were. The in crowd, whatever title they come with now, the popular people. And oh, to be associated with them. Could I get in with them? Could I be in their company? Did we ever really grow up? What is a celebrity, a person in our day who is celebrated, an athlete, an actor, somebody famous, they're known, they're adored, perhaps envied. You want to meet somebody famous. You want to be able to tell people that you met someone famous. You love to tell the stories about how you met that guy who's closely related to that really famous person that almost everybody knows. Now, wouldn't it be great if some famous person knew your name, maybe dropped your name at a post-game press conference or retweeted you? What if you got invited to a celebrity's house? What if you went from fan status to personal acquaintance? What if you moved from personal acquaintance to friend, confidant? What if you moved from friend to family of somebody famous? We're drawn to that idea. We think about what it means for us to know personally the God of the universe. And for the God of the universe to know personally us by name. For the God of the universe to enter into familial relationship with the likes of us. It really is staggering. It really is too good to be true. The biblical doctrine of adoption is simply staggering when you think about it. When you think, first of all, about who God is. That God is self-existent. He just simply is. Everything else that exists is a derived existence, a dependent existence. 
We don't intrinsically possess life. It is given to us. It is sustained for us. It can be taken from us. But God simply is. That is, he needs nothing outside of himself in order to be. And God is also supremely, infinitely, completely, and totally happy. He's happy. He, he needs nothing to change his mood. He needs nothing outside of himself to cause him to have joy. He's not dependent on circumstances. He's not dependent on relationships. And just as he needs nothing to substantially exist, he also needs nothing to make him happy. He simply is so. And God is holy. Holy. Fundamentally, it just means that God is separate. He's different. He's different than every created thing. He's totally holy, separated from, of course, everything that is sinful. He is morally holy, morally separated from that which is filthy. But he's also essentially holy. That is, in his very being, in his very essence, he is different than everything else. He is uncreated, he is the creator and sustainer of all things, and everything else is created and dependent. Even those seraphim, those fiery creatures in Isaiah 6 who have never sinned, cry out in the presence of God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Everything is different than God, and God is transcendent. That he is, he is infinitely beyond everything that we know. You can't go far enough from here to escape the boundaries of what God is. We just sang, great are you, O God. It just means he's big. Infinitely so. It, it's incorrect to think of God in terms of size or speed, duration, location. He is fundamentally transcendent to the created order. And when you think about who God is, and, and then you think about who we are, first of all, we're creatures dependent upon something outside of us for our very existence. In other words, God has no peers. He, he has no buddies to lean on. He has uh, no one outside of himself that he uh, can get something from in some sort of equal exchange. No, we are creatures utterly dependent on him. We give nothing to him. He is independent of us. And secondly, we are miserable we are just miserable company. Be around any one of us long enough and you'll find that I am a bad apple. We just wouldn't make good company for anybody on an infinite scale. And you know this, you spend enough time with somebody else and you realize, ooh, I'm going to have to exercise selfless sacrificial love if I'm going to spend the rest of whatever duration of time with this person. And you know what's worse for the other person? If they're going to spend time with you. <laughs> we would get tired of us. Who would want me for eternal companionship? And, and worse than that, we're just fundamentally unholy. In a moral sense, we're not separated from filth. It actually comes out of us. It's in our hearts to sin, to rebel against God, to do things that aren't for His glory, to do things that aren't to please Him. We fundamentally live for us, for our glory, for our good. We're self-absorbed by nature. And our lives are just by nature consumed with sin, rebellion against God, and because of that enmity with God, we're ungrateful. We act as if the universe was made for me. And it was made by God, for God, for His glory. We don't come out of the womb thinking about others and seeking to glorify God. We come out of the womb thinking about ourselves. 
We're sinners against God by nature, and that nature produces a whole host of activities that actually produce enmity with God. When you think about what we deserve, what we deserve is the wrath of God. We have set our lives and our trajectories opposed to Him, opposed to His ways. It's not in our nature to submit to His authority. We don't like anybody telling us what to do. And so, out of the womb, we have stiff-armed our Maker, and yet demanded things from Him. We don't like the way He runs the universe. We think we could do a better job. And for that God to contemplate a relationship with this sinner, to even think about it, is staggering enough. For God just to simply not destroy me on the spot is remarkable mercy, unspeakable kindness. But then for God to choose to enter into some sort of relationship with a creature like me. And not just any old relationship, but even that he would call us friends. The Lord Jesus called himself the friend of sinners. And that God would seek to make us and call us sons. Unbelievable. To to bring the likes of us into his family. To, To treat us like a good, loving father would treat his own children. When all that we've done would earn everything besides his love. Romans has already told us that while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. God shed abroad his love in our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. God is the initiator of love for unlovely creatures. And that love extends to this unbelievable doctrine of adoption where God pulls us out of the gutter and puts us into the palace. It's like all of those fairy tales you read about except it's true and infinitely better. I would contend that the doctrine of of adoption is better than the doctrine of justification. If you're allowed to have favorite doctrines, I know I'm (laughs) skating thin ice here. Listen, justification by grace alone through faith alone, that God is willing to declare a sinner righteous, not on the basis of that sinner's merits, he has none, he's only incurred greater liability, but on the basis of a substitute in his place. Jesus Christ the righteous went to the cross to pay for sins and to provide God's perfect righteousness as a free gift to any who would believe. The doctrine of justification is absolutely critical. It's foundational to the Christian life. And yet the good news of the gospel does not stop at justification. It does not stop at you being qualified by God by sheer grace. It means that you are qualified by God by sheer grace to be in his family. To be adopted. To belong to him. And and this is the fundamental promise of the Bible. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will call me by name, and I will call them my own. Again and again and again, that refrain throughout your Bible is met in this great doctrine of adoption. Jesus introduced this in the first page of the Gospel of John. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. And the same gospel writer, John, writes in a letter decades later, see how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we would be called the children of God. And such we are. The children of God, as described in the doctrine of adoption, is not universal. That is, it is not true of everybody who walks the earth. It is true of those who are born again. 
Now, there is a sense in which every human being is, a, is, is one of the children of God. Paul uses it in a, in a universal sense in Acts 17. We are God's children by creation and by accountability. That is, it, just merely in the sense that we're dependent on God for our very existence, He can be called Father, and He's the Father of all. And every human being is, is a child of God in that sense. And, and as God's child by creation, he is also God's child by accountability and will have to answer to God at the end of his life. But that is as far as the father-child relationship goes for anyone who is not in Christ. This doctrine of being the, the children of God by sovereign love, by free grace, by invitation into the family to receive all the benefits of being in the family of God and of direct access to God and familial relationship to call Him my Father. All of that belongs only to believers in Jesus Christ. And what a rich privilege it is. What I want to do this morning is unfold some of those unimaginable privileges of being God's children. And by unimaginable, I just mean these are realities we could not dare to imagine. If they weren't written for us in Scripture, we would dare not say them. Because of the infinite distance between who God is and who we are, between what God is like and what we are like, between what we deserve and what we get. These things really are unspeakable except that we could repeat what God himself has promised. And so let's read together. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17 is our text. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. These unimaginable realities. We're going to look at six of them here in this passage. They are true in the gospel, even though they ought to seem too good to be true. The first one is progressive sanctification. Progressive sanctification. This is what we looked at last week in verse 14, that all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. What are Christians being led by the Spirit of God to do in this passage to put to death the deeds of the body? That is, to fight sin. The believers have the Holy Spirit, a person dwelling inside them by which they can effectively do battle with that which displeases God. When you're only in the flesh, when you're not in Christ, when you don't have the Holy Spirit living in you, you don't have the necessary capabilities, weapons, armaments to fight sin effectively. And so you end up on the hamster wheel of trying to deal with sin without the things that actually deal with sin. But a believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit is in the practice of putting to death the deeds of the body. This is what the Holy Spirit leads believers to do. It is a perpetual pattern. It's not a perfect practice, but it is the regular pattern of the life of a Christian. And it is progressive. It is progressive. This progressive sanctification or progressive set apartification or progressive holification is a progressive being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, being transformed bit by bit into the image of the Lord from one glory to another, as from the Lord the Spirit, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Now think about this. In an earthly adoption process, you give your name, you give your love, you bequeath your possessions to your adoptive children. But you cannot impart your nature. You can't give your adoptive children your DNA. But think about what God does for his children in adoption. He not only makes us sons, but begins a process of radical transformation from the inside out to bring us into conformity with his own character. We are said to be made partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1.4. What a great, unimaginable privilege. 
One of the privileges of adoption is that I get to start looking more and more and more like Jesus as I walk the Christian life by his power, according to his purpose, for his glory. And listen, that's so much better than the old me. There's a second really unimaginable privilege of adoption into God's family. It is unassailable freedom. Look at the first half of verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. This is a negative way to say something very positive. This is telling us that the Holy Spirit's presence in the life of a Christian does not produce the kind of thing your old life was all about. Literally, he does not leave us into slavery again unto fear. That is not the Holy Spirit's work. This is the Holy Spirit in view here, and Paul is telling us what the Holy Spirit does not do. Lead us into slavery again to fear. Now, what slavery has Paul been detailing for us in this letter to the Romans? Slavery to sin. A tyranny under sin, under the reign of sin, Romans 5.20. And what did it mean to be under the reign and the tyranny of sin? It also meant to be in fear of death and under the law. And what a tragic combination all of those things are. If you sin, you die. If you're a slave of sin, you can only sin, and the law hangs over you like the sword of Damocles swinging over your neck, telling you what the standard is, telling you that you can't meet the standard, inciting you and provoking in your flesh your own desire to break the standard, and then the law condemning you for having broken the standard. What a tragic combination to be a slave of sin and to be under law, it can only produce fear. It is the operating principle of all of man's religions. Do this or else. Do that or else. Have I done enough? I don't know. I hope God's merciful. I try, I try, I try. The hamster wheel of human religion is based on rules, regulations, while being a slave of sin, leading only to fear of death. It cannot produce the guarantee of eternal life. Romans 8 is all about assurance of salvation, something nothing outside of Jesus Christ can provide. Go to church all your life. Do all the religious duties your entire life. Do them better than everybody else, and you will never get to heaven. Why? Because the flesh profits nothing. Only the Spirit brings about life. The Spirit of God does not lead us back into that old slavery. It does not lead us into a slavery unto fear of a perfect standard hanging over us that we can never meet. And as a slave of sin, never able to extricate ourselves from this bondage. Listen, some people hit the eject button on man-made religion, and that's partly good. But then they make up for themselves their own standards. And you know what? Nobody can meet their own standards. You say, I'm going to make my own religion, the religion of Smedley, and these are going to be the rules. Guess what? I can't keep my own rules. No matter what law you put in place, no matter what religious exercises you put in place, no matter how low you put the standard, you will never be able to meet it, and you will forever be under fear, in a slavery of sin, and under law. Hebrews 2 tells us that Jesus came and died to free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. And listen to what the Spirit does. Sets you free. Unassailably. Inalterably. This is all bound up in this little word, again. You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, meaning never again will you be under this tyranny. Never again will be on the, you be on this hamster wheel. If the Holy Spirit is inside you, you live a new life, you're under a new jurisdiction, you are no longer under the reign of sin, you are under the reign of grace. And everything is different. No more empty toil under the law. You can never go back to that bondage. And listen, verse 15 is not a command saying, you must not be a slave like you used to be fearing. It's just a statement of fact. The Holy Spirit of God does not, will not, cannot put you back under that slavery. It's not his business. This is a freedom that can never be taken away. It is a positional change once and for all. 
To be adopted into God's family is to be out from under the reign of sin, placed under the reign of grace, under new management, a new operating principle, new governance from the inside out. And we have to be careful. When we see the word fear here, it's negative. There's a good kind of fear, right? We, we wouldn't want to confuse the fear of slavery under the tyranny of sin and the fear of death. We wouldn't want to confuse that with the right kind of biblical fear, which is what? Fear of God, right? The fear of the Lord, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. There's a right kind of fear, but listen, a reverential sense of God's majesty. God, you are great, and I want to get closer. The right kind of fear of God draws us towards him. The, the, the kind of fear that Paul is describing here that we've been set free from is the sniveling, weaselly fear that's really self-absorbed. Oh, what can I get away with? Oh, I hope I'm not in trouble for that. Hope I don't do this. Don't step on that thing. But a fear of God draws us close to him in reverential awe, a fear akin to the respect that a, a loving son has toward a good father. It is trusting fear, a fear of God that produces love, not aversion, that God is great and God is good. It would be wrong for somebody to say, I'm not afraid of God. <laughs> Watch out. But to fear the Lord because you love Him, because He's great and holy and awesome, and He's drawing you close. <laughs> ask Isaiah, ask the Apostle John what it was like to be in God's presence. <laughs> there is a reverential awe that is appropriate. The slavery to fear under sin and death is keep the rules, do these things or he's going to get me. And it's really about self-love and self-preservation. And that's only natural. It's the only kind of response that a natural man can have. It's an oppression that does not end in love for God and it actually causes men to remake God in some way that's sort of tolerable. The Holy Spirit does not put you into a slave relationship leading to servile fear again, but rather he puts you into a family. And this leads to the third unspeakable privilege of adoption, a familial relationship. Look at the second half of verse 15. You have received instead a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. There's a strong contrast in this verse, between the first half and the second half. You have not been led to a slavery to fear again, but to something else totally different, adoption as sons. To have been moved from enemy to beloved. From a slave to a friend, and, and listen, I, I know the New Testament is full of the description of Christians as the slaves of God, and that's right. We're, we're called slaves uh, probably more often than, than a lot of other titles, but the biblical writers all called themselves the slaves of God. The slavery to God as a, as a good master is a good thing. The, the contrast between slavery under someone who wants to kill you and destroy you and someone who actually laid down his own life to give you life, that's a different kind of slavery and it's good. But one time Jesus even said to his disciples, I do not call you slaves, but friends. And God is unbelievable in his description of us to call us not just friends, but sons, his children, invited into his own family. And Paul says, you have received a spirit that is the Holy Spirit. And, and this was true when you were born again. It is never to be undone. Once the Holy Spirit comes into the life of a believer, he never leaves this is the person of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And you have received the Holy Spirit, a spirit of adoption as sons. And, and it's probable in my mind that, that Paul has the Roman concept of adoption in mind here. Uh, it is true that sonship and a, and a son relationship to God was true in several places in the Old Testament. In fact, in Romans 9, 4, one chapter to the right, Paul says this, the Israelites, to whom belonged the adoption as sons, 
So it's right to see an Old Testament theme of of God as father and his people as sons, but most often in the Old Testament, the idea was the people of God together were called the son of God or the sons of God. What's in mind here, I think, in the backdrop of of Paul writing to the people in Rome is the Roman conception and the, the legal practice of adoption which was a legal transaction whereby uh, this allowed someone to declare a non-natural child to be his own, to have the legal status, the legal and social status of being in the family, of being heir to the father's possessions, and having all the rights and privileges and advantages of belonging to the one who adopted him. And this conception of adoption was supremely personal and relational. And I believe because of the inheritance language that follows that this is more likely the idea of adoption that that Paul has in view here. And he says, by the Spirit, we cry out. We cry out. Notice the pronoun we. Paul is including himself. That says something about the family we're adopted into. Paul is saying, I and all of you, Christians, we together cry out. And this family relationship is vertical, personal with God, a personal relationship with Him, and it is also personal, relational, horizontally with each other. The word Paul uses here is a word for fervent, rather loud speech, crying out like you really mean it. This is a compelling desire welling up in the heart of a believer to call out to God as Father, Father. And notice the language that's used here. By the Spirit, we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba here is an Aramaic term. It's it's an affectionate term, probably rightly translated something like Daddy. It's warm, personal, affectionate. Jesus addressed his father this way in prayer in Mark 14, 36. This is akin to us saying, God, I, I know you, and, and, and I love you, and, and you are my God. I belong to you. It's the difference between saying, Jesus died for sinners, and Jesus died for me. He is my father. He is not just the father. Distant, holy, transcendent, but he's close, familial. And the fatherhood of God means that uh, he is close-knit with his family and he has affections for the members of his family and he is generous with his family and he seeks the good of his children. Listen, it's a great and marvelous thing that we are pardoned of our sin. It's another thing yet to be accepted by God, to, to be brought close and and greater still to be told we are his children by adoption, to be loved. This is tender and personal. And if you had a good relationship with your earthly father, there's something to be gained here by analogy. But the fatherhood of God is infinitely better. Maybe you had a bad relationship with your earthly father. There's something to be understood here, perhaps, by contrast. Oh, I didn't have a close relationship with my father. My father was not good. My father was not generous. My father was not affectionate. But your heavenly father, you finally have in him what a father was always supposed to be. And maybe you've grown up with no father. And you finally belong. And he is good the epitome of a good father, the ultimate example of a flawless father. And this is not merely a positional declaration, but a personal experiential change in the life of a believer. You see, what the Holy Spirit does inside a Christian is produce an internal conviction that God is your father that you know him, and you know him personally, and you belong to him, and he is yours. 
You belong to his family, and you love him. One scholar has said, we not only have the status of sons, but the heart of sons. This is personal, affectionate, relational access to God. And listen, personal, affectionate, relational prayer is the language of the Christian heart. Christian prayer is not found in empty forms or vain repetitions or endless, mindless babbling. Listen, you go to some places and they have things like prayer wheels, where if you just go up and mechanically spin this thing over and over and over again, you can even walk away and the wind will spin it for you. And because it's mechanically doing its repetitive thing, some God somewhere is appeased. That is not Christian prayer. But the heart of the Christian is, Abba, Father, Daddy. Jesus himself taught his disciples to pray what? Our Father personal, warm, affectionate. And what a tragedy when we turn that disciples' prayer that the Lord taught us into some mechanical rote thing that's just to be repeated over and over and over again mindlessly. It's designed to be the expression of a heart that I love my dad. The Holy Spirit does this in a believer. Here's a fourth Unbelievable privilege of being adopted. Personal assurance in verse 16. Personal assurance. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. One of the things the Holy Spirit does in us is to confirm and bear witness to. The the word to testify with us is, is an intensified word of giving testimony. And the Spirit himself does this. He testifies to our spirits that we are God's children. It's by the Spirit we cry out, Abba, Father, in verse 15. And it is the Holy Spirit himself that testifies to our spirits that we are indeed God's children. The child of God knows. This is subjective assurance of salvation, a subjective experiential awareness of adoption. And God is so kind in this. You see, the objective data is not enough to provide assurance of salvation. To know that God is holy, that I'm a sinner, that Jesus came to die on a cross to pay for the sins of people who believe. Those are the objective facts, all to bring us to God. But that's not enough to grant us assurance of salvation. And God is so kind to place in the believer the person of the Holy Spirit to grant experiential, subjective awareness of your adoption. I'm his. And a Christian doesn't even know why. He he knows what he knows. But I know I love God. I know I'm his. I know my sins are forgiven. What a remarkable gift from God. What an amazing privilege, the internal witness of the Spirit that we are actually children by His grace, objects of His love. 1 John 5.10, the one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony within himself. And listen, we recognize that self-deception is possible. There are lots of people who claim to be Christians that aren't. And so the Scripture tells us to examine yourself, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. And there's some appropriate checks to make sure we're not living on some vain emotion, right? There's a doctrinal check. You can't actually have assurance of salvation if you're not saved, and you can't be saved if you don't believe the gospel. You can't be a Christian if there's no practice of a Christian life in your life at all, no evidence whatsoever of the Spirit's presence. You can't say, oh, I don't want to do anything that pleases the Lord. I want to live my life my way, but I'm assured that I'm a Christian, That's not the assurance the Spirit grants. One of the tests that John gives in his letter to Christians is, do you love the brethren? If you hate your brother, you're not a Christian. Doesn't matter what you profess. Doesn't matter what you feel. And so there are real uh, tangible ways to examine, is, is this just a feeling I'm making up or do I really belong to the Lord? Listen, you do not have ground for assurance of sonship, assurance of salvation, when you are actively participating in things that run contrary to the Spirit's word 
and the Spirit's work. The Spirit granting assurance is not always the same. It is possible to quench the Spirit. It's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. It's possible to mute the Spirit's internal testimony. And and you, believer, can mute the Spirit's internal testimony by pursuing things that are not pleasing to the Spirit of God. The Spirit actually grants greater assurance when we're tracking with Him and we're yielding ourselves to Him and we're following His leadership and putting to death the deeds of the body. There's a relationship between your pursuit of God by the Spirit and the assurance that the Spirit grants. But fundamentally, every single Christian has the Holy Spirit indwelling and has variations in, but the reality of the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. The fundamental conviction internally that I'm God's, and He's mine. By the way, you can falter in your assurance and still be eternally secure. Do you understand the difference? Every genuine Christian will make it to the end. That's eternal security. Your your salvation, if you were born again by God and paid for by Jesus Christ, is you can never lose that salvation. It's in Fort Knox, locked down security forever by God. However, Your assurance of that security is subjective. And and God is so kind to give this internal testimony of the Holy Spirit in us, uh, to grant us assurance of this filial or family relationship with our Father. A fifth, immeasurable inheritance. Immeasurable inheritance. Paul says, if we are children, then we are heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. This simply means that whatever God has, he gives to us. Whatever God owns in all of his infinite, immeasurable wealth, he has seen fit, he has been pleased to, in all of his generosity, to give it to his children in love. The opposite of what we deserve, infinitely so. What does God have that he seeks to give to us? A kingdom, Matthew 25, 34. The king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The Bible says we are heirs of salvation, heirs of the grace of life, heirs of righteousness, even 1 Corinthians 3, 23, heirs of all things. Revelation 21, 7 says, he who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. What is the great, most incredible inheritance of the believer? It is God himself. God himself is the portion of his people. The psalm writer expressed this in Psalm 73, 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? Whatever else is involved in our inheritance the fact that we have direct access to God, our Father, and we get to have Him forever and ever and ever is the great infinite treasure in store for the believer. There's a sixth really remarkable privilege of our adoption, temporary suffering. Temporary suffering. Second half of verse 17 if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. How can you say that suffering is a privilege? Well, anything with Jesus is a privilege. Let's just start there. If we suffer together with him, you you mean I get to be with Jesus? I kind of lost sight of that word suffering. Until suffering really happens and then I feel it. This is not to say that suffering in and of itself is some great, wonderful thing. But suffering with Christ is an inestimable privilege. You know that everybody suffers in this broken world. But to go anywhere that Christ goes and be anywhere that He is and and have whatever happens to, to Him happens to me, I get to be named by Him. What a phenomenal privilege. And then one of the great privileges of the suffering described here is it is temporary. Everybody suffers in a broken world. Those who leave this world outside of Christ continue in endless suffering. And their worst day here in this life under God's sun on God's green earth will be better than every day in eternity 
under his wrath, paying for their own sins. What a tragedy to try to escape suffering in this life only to be met with infinite, insurmountable suffering forever and ever and ever. And the Christian's great privilege by adoption is temporary suffering. This is the theme of the next couple of verses. We'll dig into this next week. If you suffer here now with Christ, then your association with him will also bring you to eternal glory. And there's no comparison between those two things. I want to draw out for us some implications of our adoption. First of all, we can't grant assurance of salvation to other people. Did you know that? You can't go pat somebody else on the shoulder who says the right things or, or looks good on the outside and say, you're saved. I can tell. The assurance of salvation is an internal work produced by the Holy Spirit. And let me just encourage you parents to be careful not to bestow assurance of salvation on your children. Listen, your kids love to be pleasing to mom and dad at certain ages and at certain times. One of the ways kids love to be pleasing to mom and dad is to do what they do, go where they go, read what they read, say what they say, pray what they pray, repeat the theology that mom and dad love, love what they love, you know, do all the things. It's right for kids to want to imitate their parents. And so parents, be careful that, that what you hear from your kids does not get an automatic response from you. Oh, I know you're saved. Let me assure you of that. And when you have doubts, I'm going to take you back. Remember the one you prayed that prayer with mommy in the living room? That's, that, that would be dangerous to do. Not helpful to do. Listen, I know the thing you want for your kids more than any other is for them to believe in Christ. For them to be born again. And you can't give it to them. If you could cut off your right arm and trade it for your kid's salvation, I know you would. If you could give away everything you had, sell everything you owned, and purchase salvation for your kids, I know that you would. And you can't. And so you pray. And you put the gospel in front of them, and you plead with them to turn to Christ, and, and you put the beauties and the glories and the excellencies of your Savior in front of them. And, and you know what the Holy Spirit will do in the life of a genuine believer? He will produce assurance of salvation. The internal testimony that, that, that little Johnny says, oh, I, I'm God's and I know it. And, and, and there will be fruit and, and, and there will be fighting with sin and there will be other things that you can look at in the life of a, of a genuine believer. But you can't replace the internal witness of the, of the Spirit with something external. Another implication, think about what robs a genuine Christian of assurance. Think about it in your own life. Unconfessed sin, sin you don't want to turn from, that will dry you up spiritually and it will rob you of the joy of your sonship. Don't let it do that. Just stay on short accounts with God, confess sin to him, turn from sin, and enjoy the filial relationship. I'm your son and it's great to be your son. Watch out for things that deter your affections for him. Watch out for things that produce a lack of love for your brothers and sisters in this family. Those things rob a genuine Christian of assurance. Another implication is that suffering now means glory to come. There's comfort for us in suffering. More of that next week. And then finally, think about what it means that the God of the universe is dad, our father. What's involved in that? Holy reverence, affection, love, proximity. I want to be near him. Imitation. I, I want to be like him. Um, glorification. I, I want to tell everybody about my dad. Um, a desire to please him. I, I want to obey because I love him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, and what a privilege it is to invoke your attention with those words. And you hear. How often were we taught by the Lord Jesus Christ to think of you as Father, to not do things to be seen by men, but to do things in secret and and our Father who is in secret rewards. 
to, to not worry, but to run and cast our cares before you, O oh God, because you, our Father, know what we need before we even ask. Our Father, you love us and you're generous, you're not stingy, and you give and give and give to your children because you love. We are unworthy servants, and you have called us friends, and better still, you've called us your beloved children. And may we be caused more and more each day to love you as our Father, and to be eager for our final adoption, the redemption of our bodies, by which you bring many sons to glory. 